Hello and welcome. Today we're going to be looking at the feeding of the 5,000 for the readings of the 17th Sunday in Ordinary Time. The text comes from St John chapter 6, beginning at the first verse. Jesus went off to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, or of Tiberias, and a large crowd followed him, impressed by the signs he gave by curing the sick. Jesus climbed a hillside and sat down there with his disciples. It was shortly before the Jewish feast of Passover. Looking up, Jesus saw the crowds approaching him and said to Philip, where can we buy some bread for these people to eat? He said this to test Philip. He himself knew exactly what he was going to do. And Philip answered 200 denarii would only buy enough to give them a small piece each. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said, there's a small boy here with five barley loaves and two fish, but what is that amongst so many? And Jesus said to them, make the people sit down. And there was plenty of grass there, and as many as 5,000 men sat down. And then Jesus took the loaves, gave thanks, and gave them out to all who were sitting ready. He then did the same with the fish, giving out as much as they wanted. When they'd eaten enough, he said to the disciples, pick up the pieces left over so that nothing gets wasted. So they picked them up and filled twelve hampers with scraps left over from the meal of five barley loaves. And the people seeing this, seeing the sign he had given, said, This really is the prophet who is about to come into the world. And Jesus, who could see they were about to take to come and take him by force and make him king, escaped back to the hills by himself. This is one of the most exciting passages in the New Testament for a number of reasons because it, it's about to become the teaching where he explains he himself is the bread come down from heaven. The epusion bread, the bread, the super substantial bread, which we've, Jerome, rather mistranslated as daily bread, but putting that to one side for a moment. And there are arguments in, in church history about the extent to which this passage has got to do with the Eucharist. And we'll come to that next week because that's when we look at the teaching that Jesus gave about being the bread of life. But in preparation to this, we have we have the miracle itself. I've just been reading Anne Catherine Emmerich, who was a 19th century mystical nun, who had the most wonderful visions. And she had a number of visions about the gospels and wrote them down. And she describes in her vision how Jesus did this, this miracle of amplification as he cut the loaves so they simply replenished themselves and he filled these baskets they had brought him as as creation replenished itself under his touch but this passage today is really all about power it's about the juxtaposition of power and spirit which goes right to the heart of being a christian and our relationship with the world i remember when i first uh, re-became a Christian at, at 21 when the gospel became real to me and I offered my life to Christ sitting down and reading the passage of the feeding of the 5,000 and uh, this was in the mid-1970s and reading a, a book which talked about how we couldn't really know if this was a miracle but we we did know that if there was a miracle it was a miracle of touching people's hearts and getting them to share the bread so the, the hypothesis was that everyone had brought some secret sandwiches tucked up and uh, wasn't going to get them out in case they had to share them. And under the influence of Jesus, decided they would share. And thus, 5,000 people were shared already. So very much a 19th century rationalism uh, with, with, with socialist and utopian overtones. And... Uh, it's it's in under the shadow, I think, of the whole of the 19th century biblical criticism, where everything was, where the supernatural was all stra stripped out. In fact, there's so much supernatural in the New Testament, you either have to take it as it at, at face value, and accept the miraculous for for what it is, or, or you really don't bother, and you assume it's been badly overwritten by by people who had an agenda, but then you ask yourself, what was their agenda? What did they hope to achieve by overwriting, by by so distorting the message that they gave the wrong impression? And that becomes a cul-de-sac that can't be anything to achieve. 
The problem is at our end that we find the supernatural too difficult to manage. And it's, and it's easy to see why. At, at the moment, we're living in a time of very serious cultural and ideological revolution. There is in, in, in human beings this great hunger to put the world right. We see it so much is wrong. So much is wrong with the human heart. Too many people have carried their sandwiches hidden away in secret compartments of their cloak, of their clothing, and I'm willing to share. If only we could open our hearts to those who have not, um, the world would suddenly become a better and fairer place. This longing to put the world right, to deal with injustice, to deal with inequalities, is paradoxically enough a consequence of our being in the image of God. It, it's to do with the fact we are like God, and he set this deep desire in our heart to long for what is right, for what is good, for what is redemptive, what is healing. And this longing in our heart has led to so many of the renewal movements politically in history, going back 500 years to the Ranters and the Quakers and, and the Shakers, and of course through the French Revolution, to want to create a just and a, and a better society, to get rid of the power brokers who... Uh, who through the because they have so many of the resources of the world uh, keep most to themselves curiously enough today we look at people like Jeff Bezos and um, uh, and the owners of Facebook and, and the multimedia and and we discover that still uh, a tiny proportion of the world has most of the power and the resources but put that to one side at the moment because that's not the focus of the gospel the focus of the gospel is in those last few words where having seen that Jesus has done the most extraordinary sign, it is a miracle, the crowd says, right, we're going to capture him by force and make him our king and turn this thing into a political event, a political movement. We want freedom. We want nationalism. We want independence. We want justice, freedom and justice and equality with the Romans. And Jesus, we will take him and we will force him, strange idea, take him by force to make him our king. And here we come to the real dilemma of the human heart. We want things to be better. We want change. We want, well, we particularly want other people to be better, but we also want ourselves to be better. And, and we're so used to living in a, in a, a world, in a paradigm, where we, we do things by energy and intelligence, our energy, our intelligence, by force of will of the cleverest and the most energetic people. That's how we get things done. And so all the, all the empires, all the great expansionist movements, all even the, the works of the reformers are all predicated on this use of power of intelligence, of energy, of force. But the Gospels are utterly different, like a soap in a bath, almost. They're predicated on the superiority of spirit over flesh, the superiority of, of insight over intelligence. And this is very difficult for us to grasp sometimes. And even when we've grasped it, it's very difficult for us to live with because we're not in control of it. This whole drama of Jesus coming to us, God the Father creating us, and then, then this dynamic of the Trinity stalking us almost, rather like that wonderful poem by Thompson, The Hound of Heaven, hunting us down the years with his love. If you haven't read The Hound of Heaven, do. It tells us a story in the most magnificent poem, and Thompson's life in itself is highly intriguing. And so here we have God's love, his Holy Spirit stalking us in order to transform us. And the way we get transformed is not by power and energy and intelligence and effort. It's the opposite. It's by surrender, a kind of Zen of transformation, if we were going to borrow ideas from the East, which we won't. So this transformation happens by surrender, not by force. This is utterly counterintuitive to us. How is it that things can be made better by our trying less hard? And the answer is because God is the most profound 
countering to our own pride. We imagine if things are going to change, we have to do them, but actually it's him doing them through us. And suddenly there is this great partnership that takes place, one that we find very difficult to manage because his is the energy, his is the wisdom, his is the love. And if it's done by effort, the effort is of forgiveness. It's of turning the other cheek, the kind of effort we really dislike. Over this last week, <laughs> I have experienced some extraordinary humiliation. <laughs> A humiliation which was combined with uh, sharing the spotlight on my, on my, my, my impotence socially, um, politically, uh, culturally. And I found it made me very angry and and struck to the root of my pride and I was reminded yet again how hard it is to be a Christian, how hard it is to constantly turn the other cheek, to put one's affairs in the hands of God and say, Lord, I can't sort this out. Well, I could, but I would use force if I did or pride or insult. Uh, I mustn't get lured into into explaining the particular circumstances. But but for me, it was a reminder once again of the need of the transformation of the Holy Spirit. Here comes Jesus and they want to use him for force. For, now, in a way, that's always been the temptation for the church to baptize people by force, to make them behave by force, to control them by force and by threat. But actually, the gospel only works. Jesus' life and ministry was entirely predicated on, on love and faith and the work of the Holy Spirit. It would be great if we could argue people into, into sanity, to seeing things as they really were. But we can't. We have to wait for the Holy Spirit to bring in this sense of realisation what's often be called a conviction of sin. But if the Holy Spirit doesn't open people's eyes to the realization of their own, their own flaws, their own failure, their own ineptitude, their own incapacity, so that they then reach out and turn in helplessness to God, no amount of re-education will do this. Just at the moment, our culture wars are embodying a clash between spirit and flesh, between love and power, between the hubris of we can do this, we can change the world, we can give people the power to be any sex or any gender they want, we can give women the power to abort their children at will, we can give governments the power to legislate for equality, we can force people to accept inclusivity and equality. But of course, there's no such thing. The moment you examine these words under the microscope of investigation, they fall to pieces. Equality, as we've said so many times in the past, works well with numbers, but not with values. It works well with portions of things, but it doesn't with people. The last thing we as people are is equal in any way at all. We're all phenomenally different. Equal only perhaps in that we are all made by God and equally answerable to him. But beyond that, equality, this measuring of the similar, has no purchase on the human condition except as an illusion that we might be able to deliver justice or fairness which we can't. It's very easy for Christians to get sucked into trying to be nice, to identifying with these movements of reform, with these utopian visions of making the world a better place. After all, don't Christians want the world to be a better place? And the answer is, well, we'd like that, but it's not what's going to happen. What's going to happen is that this world, which is permanently flawed, is going to be gathered up and replaced with a new heaven and a new earth, a new Jerusalem. Our job is to hold on and to grab as many people by the hand in companionly pilgrimage as will accept our hand in love with our eyes fixed on Jesus because he's the image of redeemed humanity. 
we are due to become mini Christs in the sense that we're going to be transformed like him. And our next outing into the scriptures is going to be looking at the power of the Eucharist and the power of this transformation, the modelling of it on Christ. And so we're going to fall out very badly with society around us. As it says to us, surely you must come along with us to achieve these excellent outcomes of diversity and inclusion and equality and fairness for all. And we have to say, no, we can't do that. We cannot go in that way. It isn't going to happen like that. It's only going to happen when you allowed God to invade you with his love and his mercy and his forgiveness. And that love and mercy and forgiveness overflow into the lives of others who are touched by it. And then we are overcome, not by a better, clearer will to power, will to justice, will to peace, will to equality, but instead by this extraordinary love, this compassion, this surrendering that makes us more like God and hands to God the beauty of our present situation. This is the gospel, this is the kingdom. This requires a degree of spiritual insight and, and, and surrender. It's enormously difficult because it's such a challenge to our pride. It's what Jesus means by by being born again. And if we look at the Gospel of John, we see this wonderful, this wonderful pattern of Nicodemus, who is the archetypal catechumen, who comes to Jesus by night, one of the cleverest, one of the most powerful, one of the best positioned, coming by night because he doesn't want to be seen to be being vulnerable to Jesus. And Jesus talks to him of, of baptism, water and spirit. And then a few chapters later in John, we have this prefiguring of the Eucharist, the feeding of the 5,000 is going to become. We'll explain a bit of that next week. And so we have baptism and Eucharist and at the very end of the story. Nicodemus will reappear as disciple, as devotee. But in the meanwhile, we have all the, all the adventures, the achievements, the drama of Jesus this encounter with human beings. So we are being called into this act of great surrender. If the world is not good enough, it has to begin with us surrendering to God. If we are not good enough, it has to begin with him piercing us with his love. And the evidence that we've got it right is repentance. It's a shame of how we have tried to justify ourselves to ourselves with self-deception. It's a shame that we wanted to manipulate other people to, to get our way in order to try and bring the right outcome, but by the wrong means. It's a realisation of how far away God is from us, a, a gap and a chasm that we simply cannot bridge by our own longing and our own efforts. But only he can bridge by coming close to us in Christ, with Jesus. It's a reminder that, that given half the chance, human beings will always stoop to force. We'll always see Jesus as a tool to be used for our own purposes, whatever they are. Instead of discovering that we are his possession in love, to be used by him for his purposes. And they may be very different from what society wants or intends. And depending on how driven society is by the darkness that is in this world, that distorts God's intentions for humanity, depending on how driven we may find ourselves in, in deep conflict with the world. And whenever that conflict has emerged in society in the past, it has led to Christian martyrdom because the hatred and the antipathy towards God the Creator that is exemplified in this world we live in. We who live in, as C.S. Lewis so often beautifully put it, in occupied territory. We will find ourselves entirely at odds with the occupying force. So as we prepare ourselves to understand more about what the Eucharist is, what, what super substantial bread is, epusion, 
something to do with with gratuitous being we'll bring ourselves to the mass to the eucharist to the holy communion this great miracle of transformation that jesus does with the bread and the wine as an indication of the transformation he's going to achieve in our hearts to turn us from rebels into saints to turn us from people in in rebellion into people in love this extraordinary act of transformation what god can do with inanimate bread and wine he can also do with people but only with our consent it's this giving of our consent so we look at this passage and we long for jesus to feed the hungry to care for the lonely to lead his lost people and we know it must never be done by our contributing power but instead by our surrendering ourselves prayer is an act of surrender every time we pray we stop thinking and instead we acknowledge our helplessness we open up our heart and say come holy spirit pray in me i can't do it the eucharist is an act of surrender we open our mouths like children and are fed with manna with the bread of heaven with he who said i am the bread of life learning to surrender learning to abjure power political private existential is at the heart of learning to be a disciple and being a Christian and allowing him to carry us to the new heaven and the new earth in love and forgiveness in joy and gratitude to him be the glory forever and ever amen